year 2000, an uprising began in Palestine. Like most Americans, Allison Weir, the editor of a small town newspaper in California, knew very little about the conflict, other than what she had gleaned from the evening news or newspaper headlines. Neither a Muslim nor a Jew, she nevertheless became more curious about the topic of the Palestinian uprising. And as she researched it, she became increasingly suspicious that the American media were not telling us the whole story. Months later, she traveled to the occupied territories as an independent journalist to find out for herself what the U.S. media seemed to be omitting. Five years ago, I guess it was, I knew almost nothing about Israel and Palestine. I skimmed the headlines on the topic, I accepted the confusion of what I read, and like most people, I just moved on. At that time, I was the editor of a very small newspaper in Northern California, in Sausalito. I was writing about the local school district, the city council, the local fishing fleet. The Middle East seemed distant and really irrelevant to my daily life. But then finally, when this current uprising began, about five years ago, and I began to see on television those scenes of children throwing stones against tanks, I finally, at this pretty late stage of my life, grew curious and wondered what this was all about. I decided to finally pay attention and try to just understand the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And when I did that as a journalist, I very quickly picked up something I should have noticed before, which was that we were getting a very one-sided view of this conflict. I began to look into it more seriously. I began to pay more attention to the news reports, to read them all the way through, to listen to NPR uh, very carefully. And as I did that, I realized more and more that this was appearing to be the most distorted issue I think I had ever come across. I finally decided I needed to go and see for myself. And so began the most unusual trip that I've ever undertaken. During my month of traveling through the Palestinian territories, I had found a population under siege. Throughout Gaza and the West Bank, people were being kept virtually in prison. I found that there were Israeli military checkpoints that limited and often totally prevented, if you were Palestinian, ingress and egress from their towns and villages. And by checkpoints, I don't mean toll booths or something. I mean soldiers in combat gear carrying machine guns, often sitting in tanks. I went through residential neighborhoods that were bullet riddled. Homes with large holes in the roof through the wall, bombed out homes. When children saw that I was interested in the spent bullets scattered on the floors, they brought them to me by the handfuls. In Gaza, I saw beautiful agricultural lands bulldozed, orchard after ancient orchard that had been raised. I saw 100-year-old palm trees next to the sea that had been flattened, an entire grove of them. I saw families whose breadwinners at that time had been out of work for five months, now it's five years because they were not allowed out of their towns to go to their work. I met people who were the only ones still working for an extended family of 40. This is the reality in occupied Palestine. I talked to women living in tin shanties and tents in the dirt. They had had homes. They were not inherently penniless people. One woman had had two homes. One was for her son who had just gotten married. But Israel had wanted their land, so it had bulldozed their homes. Since thousands of children, literally, have been injured by American weapons, they're not hard to find. I saw boys with holes through their stomachs, in their heads, in their backs. I saw a brain-dead 12-year-old. He had dared to throw stones at Uzi-carrying, tank-wielding soldiers. I saw boys who will never walk again. They won't skip, they won't have children, they won't frolic. Their childhoods are finished. This is what I saw in Gaza. And then I visited Ramallah. I visited a newspaper office with sandbags around against the bullets the Israeli military shot at them on occasion. And then I visited Bethlehem where I saw an infant. I saw a hospitalized baby whose mother had not been able to visit him for months because she was not allowed out of Gaza to visit her sick baby. And this is what I saw in Palestine. But it's not what I saw when I read the San Francisco Chronicle when I returned to the United States. And I went to the library to see, upon my return, 
what the newspaper had printed for the 30 days that I was gone. As I looked through the pile of newspapers, I was appalled at what had been considered news coverage. I discovered that there had been no mention of nine-year-old dead Obai, no mention about a mother of three being killed in Ramallah, nothing about paralyzed children or women drinking tea in the dirt. Instead, I read only about an Israel under siege. I found it difficult to answer their questions. I was tired of telling people that Americans don't know what we're doing, that our newspapers don't tell us. Three months after returning from Palestine, Allison Weir quit her job and founded If Americans Knew, an organization dedicated to quantifying the ways in which the American media was misinforming the public about the conflict. Ms. Weir explains her group's methodology, analyzes the data, and reports on the key findings. We decided to really look into the news coverage of Israel and Palestine analytically and statistically to really understand what is going on. And we decided to choose clear, objective categories that would be as immune as possible to subjective interpretation. And we decided to look at how deaths were being covered by our media. Now the important thing is that we looked at how deaths were being covered among both populations, Israelis and Palestinians. It's my view, and I'm sure yours, that they're all human beings, that all human beings' deaths are equally tragic and, and quite newsworthy. We looked at the first year because that's such a significant period. First impressions are so powerful. They lead us all to conclude about who initiated the violence, who is retaliating, who is the victim, who is the aggressor. It's very significant. Then we decided to also look at the coverage for last year, for 2004, to see if any patterns we discovered in the first year were then continued in the second year or whether coverage changed significantly. We specifically studied the New York Times and the three major networks. We looked at ABC, CBS, and NBC, their evening primetime news shows. Now to do this study, the first job was a very sad job to discover how many people had been killed during those two years, how many Israelis and how many Palestinians. And to learn that fact, we went to an Israeli human rights organization, B'Tselem, which is very respected and quite careful in its gathering of data. It gathers information for both Israelis and Palestinians. So in looking into how many people had been killed in that first year, we discovered that 165 Israelis had tragically been killed by Palestinians and that 549 Palestinians had tragically been killed by Israelis. In 2004, what you discover is that 107 Israelis had been killed, which was a reduction. It was about 30% less than the first year. So they had experienced a calmer period of time. For the Palestinian population, however, you discover that the n amount of death had greatly increased, that 821 Palestinians had been killed during that period. Uh, that they were, therefore, Palestinians were being killed last year by a rate of 8 to 1 over Israeli deaths. Now, keeping those numbers in line, we then looked at what the New York Times had reported and what these major networks had reported. For example, we found that ABC had covered Israeli deaths at a rate 3.1 times greater than Palestinian deaths. We discovered that CBS had covered Israeli deaths at a rate almost four times greater, 3.8 to 1. We discovered that NBC covered Israeli deaths at a rate four times greater than Palestinian deaths. In other words, for just to take one example, uh, CBS. We found that CBS was covering Israeli deaths at a rate of 202 percent, uh, and they were covering Palestinian deaths at a rate of 54 percent. Now, of course, the question is, how can they exceed 100 percent of, of deaths? Well, we, what we were really astounded to, to see is that it was not rare for our media to exceed 100 percent coverage of Israeli deaths because we were counting every mention, every report of a death that was being made of, of either population. And we found that f quite frequently there would be follow-up reports uh, about Israeli deaths so that one death would often be reported on twice.
So it's this kind of disparity that we discovered. Now, in 2004, did these patterns uh, get better? You would hope that maybe, you know, our reporters and our editors would would improve over time, and we found that was not the case. We found that the, basically they hold they held the same, and in fact, in a number of cases, the distortion that we found in the first year had grown even greater. We saw that ABC, for example reported on 157% of Israeli deaths, and at the same time they reported on 39% of Palestinian deaths. In other words, a disparity of four to one. We noticed that with, with CBS, the uh, ratio of differential between reporting on the two populations was also about four to one. They had reported on Israeli deaths 3.8 times greater. And we found that NBC was, was actually worse than those two. It had reported Israeli deaths at a rate 4.4 times greater. Uh, this is, this, these are enormous differences. We, we have to be careful not to sort of say, oh, that's not bad, it's only three times greater. You know, some variation is certainly allowable. It's difficult to gather all the deaths and, and to do a perfect job. Certainly none of us should expect or, or ask for perfection from our media. But when you have distortion that's over two times greater, that's a major, major factor, and we're seeing it three and four times greater. Now what's even more troubling is when you look at how children's deaths are being covered. Because children's deaths, of course, are especially tragic to so many of us. Almost everyone throughout the world feels that children are illegitimate targets of strife. Their deaths are uh, intolerable. There's something that the world should prevent. So it's very important to see how our media are reporting on the large numbers of children that have been killed in this conflict. Now again, the first thing that we always should ask, and I hope we'll always remember to do this everywhere, is how many children were killed among both populations. When we hear a, 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 a number among one population anywhere in the world, let's always ask, well, what about the other population? I want the full information. So again, we had the very sad job of looking at how many children were killed in this conflict in the first year and then again last year. We discovered that in the first year, 28 Israeli children had been tragically killed. And we discovered that 131 Palestinian children had been tragically killed during that first year. Now let's look at 2004, a period of relative calm, as our media were telling us. Well, again, we find a difference. Uh, it's very significant. We learned that 2004, eight Israeli children had been tragically killed by Palestinians, and we learned that 179 Palestinian children had been tragically killed by Israelis. In other words, a rate is Palestinian children were being killed last year at a rate 22 times greater than Israeli children. Now here's an example of what the New York Times covered in that first year. We found that the New York Times covered Israeli children's deaths at a rate 6.8 times greater than Palestinian children's deaths. They reported on 125 percent of Israeli children's deaths. And for that same year, they reported on 18 percent of Palestinian children's deaths. Let's look at what they did in 2004. In 2004, we found that the disparity had grown even greater, and the New York Times reported on Israeli children's deaths at a rate over sec seven times greater than they had reported on Palestinian children's deaths. Then you look at the, the TV networks, and they make the New York Times almost look good. <laughs> Uh, the television networks, the, the disparity in coverage of children's deaths is truly off the charts, which of course is the name of our reports. And as, as we describe our reports, you'll see how that phrase continues to fit the media coverage off the charts. So we found that the networks had covered once again Israeli children's deaths at far greater rates. And remember, we're not even measuring how much time was spent on each death the wording that was used, uh, how much personal information was given. I have no doubt that that would increase this differential even far greater than I'm describing. We're just talking about a death even having been reported or having been mentioned and finding enormous distortion there. We found that in the first year of covering children's deaths, 
ABC covered Israeli children's deaths at a rate 13.8 times greater than Palestinian children's deaths. We discovered that CBS covered Israeli deaths at a rate 6.4 times greater than Palestinian children's deaths. We discovered that NBC covered Israeli children's deaths at a rate about 12 and a half times greater than Palestinian children's deaths. These are all children. Their deaths are all tragic. Why are we hearing about one population's deaths at a rate up to 13 times greater than we're hearing about another population's deaths? As Americans, we need full information, not information about only one population. Then we look at what the networks did in 2004. In 2004, we found that, again, this, this immense distortion was going on. We discovered that ABC covered Israeli children's deaths at a rate nine times greater. CBS covered Israeli children's deaths at a rate almost 13 times greater. And NBC covered Israeli children's deaths at a rate approximately 10 times greater. Once again, a huge differential based on ethnicity in the reporting that we're getting from our media. Another way of looking at these deaths is in the following charts, where we show on one side uh, the Israeli column is in blue, and you'll see that the top half of the column is a, a different shade of blue. Those are the repetitions of deaths that were reported in our media, where that makes the blue column, which is the Israeli death column, look significantly higher than the amount of death that was actually going on on the ground. Then you compare that to the red column, the Palestinian column, and you'll notice that the top half, far, far more than half, I'm afraid, of that column is a vast empty column of Palestinian deaths that were never even reported once, making the Palestinian death column look far smaller than it was in reality. Now, of course, though, that empty column is full of tragedy. Every one of those children, or men, or women, whoever was, was killed, is still being mourned by their families. And yet their deaths were invisible to the American population, whose tax money Israel is using. That's why we have to know these facts. Another very revealing way of looking at these deaths is to chart them chronologically. Uh, in the following chart, the first line that you'll see is how the New York Times reported the deaths, the Israeli deaths. Now, in the next line, we'll show you the number of Israeli deaths that had actually occurred during that first year. Now, the next line will show how Palestinian deaths were reported in that first year. And the final line will be the number of Palestinian deaths that actually had occurred during that year. As you'll see in time after time after time, the curves all follow the Israeli death rate rather than the Palestinian reported deaths following their own death rate. This is startling to me and I, I suspect will be startling to many people. Now I'd like to just mention a few other studies in addition to these major media that I've just described. Many people perhaps listen to NPR, to National Public Radio, and, and uh, consider them considerably better. In fact, a number of years ago, there was a boycott and a great deal of pressure by pro-Israel organizations against NPR, saying that NPR was pro-Palestinian. Well, another organization, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, FAIR, a very respected media, media watchdog organization, did a similar study. Uh, actually, their study preceded our studies of NPR's coverage of deaths. The researcher who did this excellent work, Seth Ackerman, discovered that NPR was reporting Israeli children's deaths at a rate of about 90 percent, and it was reporting Palestinian children's deaths at a rate of about 20 percent. Now, does this kind of reporting continue around the country? What about smaller newspapers around the country? We found that typically the reporting actually gets even worse in other publications, partly because many of the, the deaths of Palestinians are reported in the, the very last paragraphs of newspaper reports. And so naturally, when a newspaper is cutting uh, a long news report, they cut out a lot of the Palestinian deaths. In some cases, for example, with the San Francisco Chronicle, which used to be my newspaper, 
We discovered cases, however, where there were deaths reported of Palestinians, in, in one case of a nine-year-old boy who had been killed. The death was reported in the news story, as I recall, in about the third paragraph in the wire service report. The San Francisco Chronicle Foreign Desk had cut out that paragraph of the report they, they printed in their newspaper. So we've discovered, for example, with a six-month study we did of the San Francisco Chronicle headline uh, coverage of this conflict, that they were reporting on Israeli children's deaths at a rate 30 times greater than they were reporting on Palestinian children's deaths. Another small newspaper, also in California, that's where I'm, I'm from, but I'm finding these are typical. We've done these studies of Connecticut and Oregon as well. But for example, with the San Jose Mer Mercury newspaper, we did a study of their, their front page coverage because again, front page coverage is very significant. And we discovered that they had in fact reversed the reality on the ground. In other words, their headlines made it appear that more Israelis were being killed than Palestinians. And in fact, by a, by a great percentage. Uh, this is just extraordinary when you think about it. Consider if the, the Mercury News or our, our networks had reported the World Series backwards. Imagine if they had reported the winner to be the loser and vice versa. They would be the la laughing stock around the country. Everyone would notice, uh, you know, late, late night comedians would be making jokes about it. Here we have a situation of life and death with this kind of error being committed daily and no one is even noticing it. Um. Now again, let's look at what this omission entails, because mainly what we, what we discovered was omission. And of course, we all know the most effective lying is lying through omission, because no one even knows what's missing. So by omitting so many of these deaths, it also omitted what was the cause of their death? Um, what were these people like? What was going on? We discovered that in looking at children's deaths, we especially looked at the first month and collected the data we could gather on the Palestinian children who had been killed in that first month. Keep in mind that in that first month there had not been a single suicide bombing in Israel. There had not been a single roadside bombing. There had been no bombing. No, uh, not a single Israeli child happily had even had, had died yet in this conflict. And yet we found that child after child after child in the Palestinian territories had been killed. And as you'll notice, as you look at these reports, the largest single cause of their death was gunfire to the head. This we have found repeatedly to be the case. We also, of course, this omission and our reports didn't cover the injury rates, but Palestinians have been injured in also far greater rates than Israelis have been injured. For example, we discovered that in the first three months alone, 159 Palestinian children had had eyes shot out. Now where did that fact come from? Certainly not from the New York Times. We didn't get it from, quote, Palestinian propaganda. This was reported in the Israeli newspaper Haaretz, a very respected newspaper in Israel. We need to know these facts too. Israelis are getting these reports. Americans should also get them. Finally, in many ways, perhaps the most significant omission in our media's reporting is our own connection to this conflict, um, the American connection to it. We need to always know that factor. And it turns out that unlike my initial impressions, it seems so long ago now, five years ago, uh, where I thought this conflict was basically irrelevant to me, that I didn't have much to do with it, I've learned that Americans are major players in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict because we give over $10 million per day to Israel. In fact, when you count up everything, all the loan forgiveness programs, the weapon, weapons subsidies, uh, etc., the amount of American tax money to Israel is approximately $15 million per day. Now, if this sounds like a lot, that's because it, it is. It's off the charts of our foreign expenditures abroad. We give to Israel, which has a population of about 6 million people. Uh, that's the size of the San Francisco the Bay Area, for example. We give them more than we give to all of Sub-Saharan Africa put together. This is a very important statistic to know.
we give more to Israel than we give any other nation on earth. Why don't more of us know this? Are we just lazy, uh, self-absorbed people? I, I don't think Americans are that bad. I think most of us try to do a good job. And those of us that try to uh, read our New York Times, listen to our uh, network news coverage, it turns out that they are not reporting this. We did a study, for example, of the San Francisco Chronicle. During six months of reports, we found that the Chronicle had run many, many news stories on this important topic. In fact, you would have thought it was ample coverage. They were running more news stories on Israel-Palestine than some local issues of, of great importance. And yet, we, we counted up how many times the Chronicle had even mentioned U.S. aid to Israel and found that out of that over 250 stories, they had only mentioned aid to Israel three times, usually in the, the last sentence of the story. And how many times had they given the full accurate figure of the amount of aid that, gives, that goes to Israel? We found they had never once done that. Sadly, what I've mentioned here today is really just the tip of the iceberg about the, the coverage and really lack of coverage of Israel and Palestine. I cannot suggest too greatly the profound seriousness of this situation. This is potentially an apocalyptic situation as we see the tragic war in Iraq, the discussion of perhaps warfare, certainly sanctions against Iran, against Syria. This is promoting regional instability of the greatest danger to the region, to all people in the region, to the entire world, and certainly to Americans as well. We need drastically better coverage and fuller coverage of what's going on. We need the full facts. Our children, I feel, I have three children, I feel that our children are being placed at serious risk by American policies. Now, other Americans can and should draw their own conclusions, but they cannot draw informed conclusions without having full, unbiased information, and we're not getting that yet. We won't get that until we all demand it.